Hey up everybody and welcome back. Well I'm sure you're a little bit surprised to see that I'm going to work on the Henderson engine this week seeing as we're so close to the end of the uh, the Ambasaki but there is a reason for it so I will explain that to you. Now you may remember I mentioned in the last video that I had to work on our lawn tractor. Well I wasn't going to you know I don't like doing videos about stuff that aren't sort of bike workshop related you're not going to see me doing any barbecues or anything like that but as you're all sort of um, machinery oriented I thought you might be interested in if I just spent a couple of minutes to tell you where it happened for this and why I've been working on it for three days okay so to recap slightly it stopped driving while Linda was using it and this has a hydrostatic system on it so although it's got a v-twin diesel here that drives at the back a big hydraulic pump and that works everything the wheels the uh steam it's got power steering the, the deck lifts power and all that sort of thing so linda really likes it so anyway when i looked as i mentioned the belt had come off so it was out in the, the middle of the lawn uh, so i couldn't really work on it because i i took that back piece off which is like the back mud guards and seat and everything and it was obvious I needed to be in the workshop so what I managed to do in the end was pick it up using the big tractor with the bucket I sort of got behind it with the bucket down and just lifted it up with a couple of ropes on got it in here so I'd taken that back off I took the front part off to see what the problem was here's a couple of pictures to show you what the problem was you'll be surprised I was actually shot so here's what I found when I took the top off just behind and below that ratcheting thing you see that plate with the great big break in it let's look at the next picture and there it is off the machine as you can see that the plate that the pulleys are mounted on is virtually torn in two Here it is bead blasted ready for welding <clears throat> and as you can see part of the reason is that uh, just around the tube that's the pivot it never welded you can see there was no penetration so I guess it started to break and then there was nothing holding it just pulled in two. Right so that was my problem I had to uh, get that off to weld it up I thought fine well <sighs> That pulley system and a, a sort of block valve for the hydraulics were mounted on a plate. There's two big channels that run the length of this really thick. It's very well built. So I thought, great, you take the plate off and everything's there. Well, the plate was riveted on, would you believe? Six rip big rivets. And you couldn't get anything. Even the bolts they used were, what do you call them? Oh. The words gone out of my mind completely. The type with like a domed head, carriage bolts. They just have a domed head and then a square underneath. So they had little square holes that they locked into. So all the nuts were right underneath. I couldn't get at anything. So I thought, bugger that, we'll re-engineer this for when I put it back together. So I drilled out the six rivets and just cut the heads off the two bolts that held the valve on. Because that was all on the other thing about that. It was all hard lines. So I couldn't just take the plate out and sort of get at things with flexible lines. So that stayed in situ, took the plate off and uh, the six places where it was riveted on, they were all thick enough that I could tap them 5 16 fine. And the same with the valve thing, that had plenty of meat so I tapped that. So now everything goes on the top and bolts down. Easy you'd think. So I did the welding, everything like that, put it back together could I get the tensioning string back, spring back on? I had to modify my BSA fork tool to put this hook on and even then I had to get all this and put all my strength to pull that and then I managed to get it on. So then of course I got it on. Could I get it on the last pulley, the belt? No. So I got George over with a big pry bar. We squeezed back the tensioning pulley and we managed to get the pulley on. So all done I thought, put it all back together again and the bugger wouldn't start. I had to take the fuel pump off I thought right to diesel so I bled the injectors got it started everything was fine so 
put it all together, push it outside to get ready to go, get it on, won't start. So I pushed it back in. I thought maybe I'd truck when I put the seat thing on, on top of the tank, I'd maybe trap the hose, took that back off again. No, everything was fine. And then I noticed the fuel filter was empty. So I have a thing here. It goes on a where are we? Goes on a vacuum pump. So I set it up and pumped right through, through the pump to the filter. Great, put it all back together again. Pump started, pumped a little bit into the filter and then all I can hear it running, click, 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 click. It's a little sort of diaphragm type pump. Didn't pump anymore. So the pump had packed up on me. So that's on order. So there you go. I don't know whether that was of any interest to you. But that's why it's now Thursday afternoon. Actually, it still isn't finished. But I thought, I'd had a couple of people ask me about the Henderson. Let me just do a little bit on the Henderson and then next week we'll continue with the Yambasaki. So let me show you what I'm doing with the Henderson. Right then, for those of you who maybe haven't watched the Henderson one, um, I have a 1927 four-cylinder Henderson engine which is going to go into a 1930s race car that a friend is restoring. It's the original car, it did have a Henderson engine but when he got it it didn't have an engine so he managed to find an engine and it was in pretty poor condition so we've been working on that. So all the bearings, the mains and the big end bearings are babbitted. Now for those of you who don't know Babbitt you know an ordinary big end bearing which has the conrod and then a cap and then in each side there's like a white metal shell well Babbitt bearings are like that only that shell instead of buying a shell and putting it in is actually poured in as molten metal the metal's called Babbitt it's named after a fellow that invented the particular alloy so doing this is not something you just do in half an hour at home you've got to build up well look up babbitin because it's a complicated process so anyway i got the crankshaft reground set the crankshaft off to get all the bearings because they're separate sort of bronze shells and the babbits poured into them then they've got to be put into where they go and it line board so that they're all exactly in line for when you put the crankshaft in so anyway all that is a way of being done and it takes a long time because there's only a couple of people that do it and you know they have waiting lists i had a viewer from australia mention uh, make a comment and mention that it was like 18 months or thereabouts waiting list in australia so it suddenly struck me this week i was thinking what can i do in between working on the tractor that it's no good me getting the cases and the crank back if i haven't got all the other stuff ready so i say it's a four cylinder there's one of the cylinders. It's a complete casting, side valves, all cast in one. So getting the pistons out wasn't easy. We just we I destroyed one getting it out. But I got the other three out and they proved to be non-standard pistons. This distance up to the deck here, deck height, whatever it is they call it, from the gudgeon pin to the crown of the piston must be more than a standard Henderson because there were these spacing pieces underneath each of the cylinders and I have a parts book and it shouldn't have them. The other thing was the Gudgeon pin was running in bushes on either side in the piston. Well that was wrong as well there shouldn't be any of those so the pistons were completely wrong so we have to get new four new pistons as well. But anyway, I thought I'd set to and do a couple of jobs. Now, I'm going to bring you in now to show you a couple of things. Now, as I mentioned, these are cast iron cylinders. And two of them had some broken fins. You can see there's one, two, three. There's another one there. Now, I've started. There was one, two, three damaged up here. I've started to repair those. So I build those up with bronze and then take them back to shape so what we're going to do is we're going to finish off doing these at the bottom so 
that was on cylinder number two. So we're going to do that today. Also, these, let me move you down and in a bit. Are the guides for the cam followers right they push into where are you? Let me get the other one. into the crankcase like that and then there's a plate that goes on that way I think to hold them down and the cases are drilled there's two bolts going that holds them stops them coming up and down when the cam followers move now, this is a cam follower, goes in there, or at least it should do, oh, I guess I've brushed it a little bit inside, there we go, see that sits on the cam, and that works the push rod, and that has a little bolt in the end to be adjustable, but you can see that one, that one's not even the worst one, actually. Some of them have got there, like that. They're really badly worn. They're nasty. So, as it happens, I'd read somewhere that cam followers for the Model T Ford could be modified. So, I ordered a set, and you wouldn't believe this, when I measured them, the foot's exactly the same size, the diameter's exactly the same size, they are 50 thou longer, that's all, but they're adjustable. And I mean, there's no plate, they're just, just perfect. So I have nice new cam followers, so that's a good start. So let me put those back in box one. Now then, to, uh, to do this, obviously we've got to take the old cam followers out. So let's have a look at doing that. Now then, I've already done a couple of these. Hang on, I'll move you up a little bit there. Whoops. And I got as black as the ace of spades, so I'll put some gloves on. So, they have this nice lip on. I can put them in there, just not really grip it even. It's just sitting on that. And I've been soaking these. So the adjuster bolt is now free. And while that's in, Start that going like that. Those Ford Model T ones have adjuster bolts in as well, so everything is fine with them. You know, I've had people in the past that worry about me hitting things. The sound must come a lot sort of louder than it is because I don't batter things. In fact, when I was taking this apart, somebody mentioned what a butcher I was. I mean, God, this engine has been, you know, it's from the 20s, it's 27. It probably hadn't been used for 40 years. You should have seen it. You just can't take these things apart with, you know, a screwdriver and a little plastic hammer. Plus, they were built with men with big hammers and screwdrivers. Anyway, so don't worry about things. Not really a butcher. So there's the original one out. Base isn't that bad on that, but it's still rotten. So we'll clean this up. And uh, when we're finished, it'll look like that. I mean, there is some pitting on the outside and everything, but although I can get Model T, what's it? I don't think I can get these. So let me uh, clean these up, and then we'll look at some other stuff. Now I've cleaned up the valves and springs and everything, just so that it makes it easier to uh, to check their condition. But I'll show you one thing of interest here. Here's the valve. There's the valve spring with its end cap. Now. Just with the Yambasaki, we were doing valves, and you saw how the collets went into there to lock this in. Well, you'll notice there's no space there to get a collet in. 
You see that little mark? One there, and one there, and that hole. Well, what there is, there's a little pin. So the spring's pressed down, and a little pin goes in there. And the little pin actually has flats on each side. And when the spring comes up, that's what locks it in. Very simple, very effective, and I guess it just kept working fine. So let me put those back. We're going to look at the valves in each cylinder. But first of all, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. I only have one cylinder to do, so let me put it in the oven because I want to warm it up. Let me bring it over here again. We're going to clean these up, but this is one huge chunk. It's like when you're aluminium welding. This is a huge heatsink. So if I don't get this heated up, then what will happen is when I start trying to TIG it, this will leach all the heat out of where I'm putting the arc and I'll keep, or I won't because I know what I'm doing now, but what happens is you keep putting heat in because you can't get it to form a puddle and the next thing you put so much heat in it starts to burn away and melt away. So if you get it warmed up first, and I'm not going to say preheated because it's just simply heated, preheated would mean before I heated it. But anyway, I'll put it in the oven, get it nice and warm so that when I start welding, all the heat's not moving away from the actual point of the weld. So let me put that in, and while that's in, we'll look at the other cylinders and their valves. Now this is cylinder number one, and the bits for cylinder number one. So as you can see, I've already done the broken fins. There's one down here as well. So the Henderson is a side valve engine not an overhead valve engine. Now, for those younger people, you may never have seen a side valve engine. You'll notice that the cylinder head is part of the barrel. And actually, my friends who are into casting things um, really marveled at this because there are so many things which are cast in, so many spaces. They're not machined. They must have been... I've forgotten the word again the bits you put in to make spaces in a casting. Uh, I've forgotten. Anyway, this, you know, it's a really, really complicated casting. So why is it called the side valve? Well, it's called the side valve, I presume, because the valves are at the side of the cylinder head, not over. They're not overhead valves. They're at the side. And the cam followers you saw are like this. Whoops like that on the cam, they go up and down and the valve with its spring is actually in that way. So there's not even a push rod in this. So here's the valve guide and down inside of here, we're going to have to be careful here to make sure you see everything is where the valve seat is. Right, you see it there? So there's the valve guide down the bottom and there's the seat. So we've got to clean out in there a little bit and then the valve is going to go in like that. So the valve goes in and sits down there. Now, you'll notice that you can see we shine the light in one side, you can see in the other side, can you? Yep. So this is just one big chamber. There isn't a separate port for each. There's our exhaust coming out there. There's our inlet. Inlet going in there, exhaust coming out there. And they have a common space. Now, as you can imagine, this isn't the most brilliant way to build an engine and that's how uh, they came to the overhead valve system which is a lot more efficient. So what we're going to do is we're going to check each valve in the guide as usual see if there's any, well in fact let's do it now with this one I 
actually there's virtually no play on that I'm trying to get this so you can that's sort of me pushing it in and out but up and down that's fine so if these will uh, grind in all right in their seats then we can use those valves international something chrome it says read it better on another one Thompson something chrome So let me get to some grinding paste and I'll just, I've just shown you grinding one, the mint, so I'll grind one and then we'll look to see how the seat and the valve lip look. And I've done the inlet and the exhaust and actually, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, it, uh, it says on these which valve is which. So there it says int and there it says X and they actually say Thompson something ill chrome oh. anyway I've ground them both I don't think you can really, I don't know if you can see there but they both have a nice uniform grey around there and again where's our little my USAF torch. I suppose I should call it the flashlight. They're the same. Nice unbroken matte grey line. So they've lapped in nicely. So I'll do all the rest of them and then we're all ready for when we can get some pistons and stuff. Now the cylinder's out of the oven and uh, what I've done is I've set up that uh, cross piece thing that I made because just like Jordi at weldingtricksandtips.com always says ABC always be comfortable so here I can rest on there and I can follow that through so let's see what we can do You know what, I don't think I'm going to use 330 seconds. Even though the fins are thickish. I'm going to use 16. Starting to build up. Whoop. Caught the bloody tungsten. All right, let's take a little break. So I sharpened the tungsten as you can see I've just started to lay it down in there gradually filling this up actually when I got to this end I don't know whether it wasn't quite clean but I got a blob now if you get a blob with a bronze it tends to follow the blob so I had to get that blob off and actually this is the way I shape the fins I have a grinder with a disc in that just fits in to the between the fins it's just the right thickness to go in between the fins so when I'm finished I can go down and smooth both sides off and then form it to the right shape so let me carry on building this up and then I'll bring it back when we're ready to shape it right I've built it up but this one's turning out to be a how not to do it one because I think what I've done looking at it vertically 
is as I've laid it down I haven't stayed vertical and I've started to move over so it's actually leaning slightly so let me grind that off and I've got a feeling I'll probably have to do it again although there'll be bronze there which will make it a lot easier and there you can see what I was talking about see how thin that edge is see I've shaped it but in here see the shiny bronze part is where it's the right thickness there so it was sticking out on this other side so I'm gonna have to melt it down and work it and the thing you've got to be careful of with cast iron like this is you do it in small pieces because if you put too much heat in you'll find the fins will crack again which defeats the whole object of doing the repair so I think I'll grind this down a little bit and then start to build it back up and reshape it then you finish it off with a file see I've built this back up again so now you just you can use that the other fins as a guide to get the right shape and then you can get in and get it flat on both sides and the final thing you can do is just at an angle well it depends on the shape of the fin of course but these go to a slightly thinner edge so you just do that and there uh, there's your fin back where it should be and then of course we'll give these a coat of black paint and uh, that'll just disappear I've started doing another one that one at least has come up straight so I'll finish these last couple off and that's all the fins repaired now there's the two barrels finished I've got all the fins done on this one and I've given them a bead blast because I'm going to paint them black and when I bead blasted them all I found something interesting there's the uh, number one the first one we did and the one we checked the valves in there's number two you will know number one has bronze valve guides number two hasn't and neither have number three or number four so either this is a different cylinder that's being put on or somebody changed the guides and as I say or as you saw the valves were a good fit in here the valves are a reasonably sloppy fit in the other cylinders so what I'm going to do, <coughs> oh pardon me, apart from cough, is uh, take these along to Dave's, to steam shops, and get him to look at the valves, and look at the valve seats, and look at the guides. Now, I want him to look at the valves so he can tell me whether the valves are worth keeping, and we'll just sleeve these guides, or whether we need new valves as well so <clears throat> what I'm going to do now just so you can see what they look like is I'm going to give these a coat of black engine enamel and then as I say you'll notice that the fins will just disappear you won't even see them the repairs but um, let me go and set these up to put some paint on them and then for next time whenever it is I'll have I've decided about the thing about the valves is you know this Babbitton as we've talked about is going to cost a fortune no doubt about it a set of valves is going to be about another five hundred dollars and then valve springs I want to get valve springs because they, they are particularly brilliant and I checked with the sort of Henderson place well the people I think who own the Henderson name in the US out in Montana and they list valve springs so that's fine they aren't all expensive they list valves as well <clears throat> but as I said they're about $60 a piece near enough and there's eight of them and shipping so it's going to be $500 for the valves so I want Dave to look at them and put his sort of 50 years of engine building experience on the job and see if we can just simply line these and use the original valves so anyway, let me go and put some paint on and then I'll show you that.
And there's two cylinders with just a quick coat of black. Uh, I can't even tell whether this is the one where I did the fins at the bottom and a couple at the top. So they've all blended in nicely. That's fine. All right, so as I say, I have to find out about valves. So I'll have to go and see Mr. Steam Shop. I'll let you know when that happens. And I'll probably maybe, well, probably maybe, sort of phrases that. I will probably do the valves and film that so that's all put together. But you've seen valves so many times, I don't know. But I probably will. Anyway, until the crank and what have you come, we really are much at a standstill with this because that's the major portion, obviously. So that's all for the Henderson for a while and uh, that's all for me for a week. So stay safe and enjoy yourselves.